So my brothers and my sisters, as we embrace this urgency of creating the beloved community, now is the time to be love. Love means understanding, redemptive goodwill toward all which seeks nothing in return. So be love by implementing the demands of justice to eliminate the school to prison pipeline that has so many black children entrapped. Be love by correcting voting policies that seek to suppress the votes of millions of black and brown people. Be love and implement the demands of justice by transforming a society that is disproportionately violent toward black lives, including black transgendered lives and indigenous lives. Be love and correct false narratives and economic policies that continue to divide and pit poor and working class black and white people against each other. Be love and implement demands of justice where systems and structures are deconstructed and lead the way of living in community that reimagines just humane, equitable, and sustainable policies, practices, and behaviors. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them who hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and abuse you. Be love and do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. On behalf of Dr. Bernice A. King, welcome. We are committed here at the King Center of dealing with the love community all over the world. And one way we're doing this is with our Be Love movement. We want you to join us and take the pledge by going to our website and then joining with the rest of the world and take the pledge. Our programs that we have designed today is in an effort to educate you, to inspire you, and to allow you to let your mind wonder on how you can best be a part of this beloved community. So now, without further ado, let me introduce you to our moderator. Our moderator is Cheryl Priam, who is on 11 Alive News here in Atlanta, Georgia. Cheryl? Thanks so much, Donald. I'm so glad to be with you. I've been lucky enough to be part of these events over the years, and it's neat to be together virtually because I actually know we have more people on this call together than we could ever pack into an auditorium. So I'm really looking forward to the time together to hear important stories of the past that really will make a difference in how we can be present and how we can all make a difference for the future. And you all, you students, really are the key to making changes in the future, and you hold a lot of power. And today we're gonna to learn more about that. And we are so honored on this panel to have Charles Alphen Sr., a senior nonviolence trainer at the King Center and a former police officer to share his wisdom and experience with us. I wanna introduce now our nonviolence spotlight series video. Welcome to our Students with King Nonviolence Spotlight Series. Today we are going to tell you about an amazing civil rights leader who helped change the world. When you hear his awesome story, it will hopefully spark something in you to make a difference and make your community better for everybody. Our Spotlight person is Mr. Charles L. Alpin Sr. He served as a police officer for over 26 years in the St. Louis City Police Department, St. Louis, Missouri. During his police career, he served as a patrol officer, detective, juvenile officer, sergeant, platoon lieutenant, and captain. 
serving in the rank of captain the last 10 years of his career. He was commander of homicide and rape and child abuse and a district commander. And he retired as commander of vice narcotics. In 1992, after retirement from the St. Louis City Police Department and at the request of Mrs. Coretta Scott King, Captain Alvin and his wife moved to Atlanta to work at the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change. What an honor! Mrs. Coretta Scott King asked him to work with her. He worked as a trainer in Kingian Nonviolence and in 1994 was promoted to Director of Education and Training for the King Center. In 1996, he retired from the King Center. He has been privileged to train both nationally and internationally in Kingian nonviolence. He has trained law enforcement officers, at risk and gang youth, educators, elementary, secondary, and college students, professors, community leaders, clergy, and correctional officers. He sure did. And if Mr. Alvin can do all of this, you can too. Presently, he serves as senior trainer for the King Center in Atlanta, Georgia. He also is a conference director and a member of the Global Nonviolence Conference Series. Charles Alvin Sr., welcome. It's so good to be with you again. I'm just honored to be a part of this with you, sir. Yes, Cheryl, it's my honor and pleasure. It's such, such good to see you again and to be uh, talking to so many people that are our future. Yeah, I'm so happy the students are with us today. And I was just thinking, they all just heard in that video, what must it have been like when you get a phone call from Coretta Scott King saying, we really want you to be part of this. Will you take on this next mission for your life? What was that like? It was phenomenal, um, just uh, unbelievable. I had been uh, to the King Center for training for seven years, uh, learning about the philosophy, and I was able to meet all the people who walked with Dr. King, Andrew Young and John Lewis, and they, this is King. And after that uh, session, <clears throat> I was supposed to be going to New York to work with the commission in New York, and that's when Mrs. King called and said, don't sign any papers, come down to Atlanta, I want to talk to you. So uh, when Mrs. King calls you, uh, you don't say no. <laughs> yeah, she calls you to, to help continue the work of, of her husband, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And that work continues today, which is why we're so glad to have the opportunity to be together. And we're so glad all of you students are joining us because you all have such a key role in what happens from now moving forward. And I know, Charles, it means a lot to you to talk to young people because at the heart and soul of the civil rights movement in the 60s were people about their age and they were the ones that changed the world. Yes, and it, it, it's, uh, the, the adults had restrictions. They, they had jobs to keep. Uh, if they were being involved in civil rights, they were fired or they fire their mother-in-law. And you can imagine if somebody fires your mother-in-law for you doing something, you're in real trouble. So they, for the, the adults, had some restrictions, but the young people were independent. And also we'll talk a little bit about Dr. King's independence because his church supported him. He did not work for corporate America. So he had a lot more latitude. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, the young people were very instrumental, not only in the United States civil rights, all around the world, which I've traveled, uh, young people took the initiative to change, to have social change. You know, for a, a lot of the students joining us today, I know they've studied this in class, they've, they've read the history books, and what we want to do is bring some of that history to life, because there is something about knowing those experiences in a different way and seeing how they apply to today in some obvious ways and some not so obvious ways. So let's start with what you feel like is most important for the students who are listening today to understand about the net, the then and how it applies to, to the things they're facing in the world around them today? Uh, yes, that's a very important question because uh, some of the young people say, well, Dr. King solved all that and it must not work because we're going through it again. 
But they have to realize Dr. King was looking at legal seg segregation, segregation among races, the buses, of the parks, the, the museums, and also in uh, voting. So he began to look at uh, how do you begin to get the law changed, legal uh, segregation. And then he went from there to human rights, uh, rights for us to feed people and, and educate, et cetera. So this philosophy is universal. It works uh, in your relationships with your parents and the school. It doesn't have a borderline to it. It works all over the world. And so this philosophy says that I began to understand how I would respect humanity. And no matter what language you speak or um, your degree, your education, that I respect you because my relationship with you is a human being. And that's what Dr. King wrote. He wrote his whole philosophy to the heart, not the color of the skin, not where you live, uh, not what your parents' degrees or no degree. He wrote it to people who have a heart and that's the connection, it's the heart connection. And that's why when Dr. King talked about the beloved community, it was people who have uh, all kinds of different experiences, different levels of, of how much money they have, different jobs, different colors of skin, whatever it might be. It was the idea of everyone coming together for one common goal of, of equality and equity. And it's true because he was looking to, to lift up humanity and he said the barriers that keep us from um, loving and, and love is different from like, and we'll talk about that, but to keep us from loving people are the, the triple evils that he identified in the 60s. That was racism, poverty, and war or violence. So those three things are what keeps us from Dr. King's beloved community. And they're, they're, they're here today. And he gave us a blueprint that how we can begin to solve this. And it takes all of us. And he just gave, he just did the first step and so it's responsible for us now, not only myself, but young people to continue that. And we're excited that they're active and understanding and they want to know more because this is not only like Donald said uh, in the introduction, this is not only an education, but also inspiration. Yeah. So as, as we're talking, I just want to encourage all the students to think about questions you have for Mr. Alvin, questions you have that you want to spark a conversation things that you want to see, how it might apply to what you're seeing in your middle school, high school, the community around you, things you watch on the news. Um, Charles, I was thinking about, as you were talking about the then and the now, I, I remember talking to Andrew Young, Ambassador Andrew Young, during the Black Lives Matter protests, and then seeing John Lewis right at the end of his life, even being active in talking about the protests and the killing of, of George Floyd and in that summertime talking about a conversation again about why nonviolence is the answer in getting the attention and the action of the world. Uh, yes, and the basic philosophy is that you don't want to become the people that you're protesting against. So you don't let the people drag you so low that you begin to hate them. I think it was Brother Douglas has said, you, you don't let people pull you down in the mud because you get muddy too. But nonviolence is a higher calling. It's a respect for humanity, but not letting people violate you. So there's a way of doing that without you becoming as uh, what you're fighting against. If you're, if you're dealing with violence, if you're dealing with people who are not treating you uh, the way you should, you don't want to become them. So therefore nonviolence is a discipline of your, your behavior and it also is reconciliation. You don't want to win over the person you're dealing with. You want to change them. So it's a whole different uh, goal in conflicts with people in school or in your family. Your goal is not to win them over, not to win over them, but to win them over. So it's a whole different attitude, a mindset that works around the world. And we've proven it. Uh, it still works today with relationships with, uh, between human beings. And I just can't stress enough just the incredible respect I have for anyone who practices nonviolence. You know, you look back at the video in, in the civil rights movement and the hours and the months of training to not respond to, you know, vicious violence or vicious verbal attacks or all the things that came against that movement but to practice nonviolence, the strength and the courage it takes is 
is enormous. And I think a good part of the conversation, because I'm sure the students that are, are joining us today, they see fights in the hallways, they see things, you know, in the neighborhood. And it's just so, you know, your, your reaction is, is to react, but to have to train yourself to respond differently because of a greater goal takes incredible strength. I said, that's what the key words you said was training, <clears throat> because you have to work on uh, loving people and also your anger. So therefore, the training is key, not only in the civil rights movement, Dr. King. <clears throat> uh, they, all before any demonstration, they were trained. They went out, they would not let people just come to their demonstration and march because there were people who uh, were provocateurs. And, and we went into, uh, uh, into Ferguson, and we've been in the Watts, et cetera, all the riots, and there are people that come to the riots just to, to break in stores, to riot, and, and provoke the police. So you have to be careful of who's with you. So that's training is key. And that's what uh, Dr. King, uh, Dr. Bernice King is doing at the King Center, of training people. How do you respond to violence? And, and in a conflict, Cheryl, you have the power. Um, you want to make sure that you don't escalate the conflict because you can have the ability to diffuse, to de-escalate. And so Dr. King was always asking himself, in the, con when, what, in the conflict, what percentage do I own? If you're in conflict with another person in your family, you have to uh, look like Michael Jackson says, the man, the person in the mirror. Look in the mirror and see what percentage of that conflict do you own? What did you do to escalate the conflict? And what could you have done to de-escalate? So that's the discipline. That's the power. It's much more powerful than violence because it, it it takes you to think. And in violence, you can just respond without thinking. And then the consequences of violence are much more devastating. Mm -hmm. And you have such a unique perspective as a senior nonviolence trainer, but also someone who served in law enforcement. And I know all the students joining us today have seen so much of the ongoing conversation about police brutality, police reform, how do we have more equity and, and equality in this arena. I love your perspective on that and what you feel like needs to happen to have some real change. Yes, the first thing, there has to be accountability. Uh, when I go in to consult with police officers, I look at the uh, frontline people. Those are the sergeants on the street. The sergeants, they have a, a, a span of control, normally six to eight officers, and that's where it starts, with the accountability on the streets. And it has to do in training and recruiting. And it's nothing new. In the 60s, when I joined the police department in 1965, we had police reform. The, the Supreme Court was involved in the police because we were kicking people doors in and, and stopping people without warrants, search and seizure. And that's when the Miranda Act came in. The police have to tell you your rights before they talk to you. That's when Terry versus Ohio, where police could not search your house, your car, without a, without the proper probable cause. So there's been reform as we struggle with what, what does a police officer do in a democracy? Now I've worked in communist countries, but in a democracy, what's the responsibility of the police? So therefore the history of policing has to be studied in the United States of America because when we first were, were police was, was formed, it was a, a volunteer. And then it got into uh, settling civil suits and then it got into law enforcement. And there's a difference in law enforcement, that's the police and lawmakers, that's the legislation. So the policemen do not make any laws. All they do is enforce the laws that you elect people to go to represent you in your state, in your city, and in your national. So police officers just are law enforcers. They enforce the law that's already made by the people you send to your state, city, and federal offices to represent you. Someone was just interacting with us saying this is why they support nonviolence because things need to happen in the ballot box, not by bullets. And I thought that was such a good way to express that because what you're saying is in the power to vote. And some of the students who might be joining us today say, well, I'm not old enough to vote yet, but it doesn't mean they can't have influence over what happens at the elections, right? Um, as I travel the world in India and South Africa, <clears throat> uh, when Mandela was elected, <clears throat> the students were involved and uh, they encouraged their parents. And in Chicago, I think Harold Washington got elected because the students told their parents, he was a part of a core league, I think, and they went home and told their parents that you've got to vote, mama, daddy, you got to get out and vote. And who has a lot of influence on parents and students? Mm -hmm. 
And therefore, uh, the students are very powerful. Around the world, uh, we saw the students were initiative. They, were the, they initiated a lot of activity that, that, that got the adults involved in change. In uh, Birmingham, Alabama, the students have participated. Over 3,000, Dr. King said, of people getting arrested in Birmingham. So therefore, there is a role for students. And they're very influential because they carry influence. They, they also carry ideas that can change because we need new ideas and we need new people that will pick up the baton from the Andrew Young and the Dr. King. Mm -hmm. And they were just ordinary people that did extraordinary things. They were not uh, people that just uh, were born with, with uh, uh, being a genius. They worked, <clears throat> they worked in the community. And Dr. King said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. And as I look around the world, all our great leaders do is serve. And there's a, there's a Dr. King and a Mandela and a Andrew Young sitting in every one of those seats of people that I'm talking to, and they can do it. And I was thinking about, I remember talking to Congressman John Lewis about he really started getting involved and, and keyed into the issues at 14, 15 years old before he could vote. You know, there was still action to do. And some of the action is just learning and being aware, which is why I'm so excited that we have this time with you today, because it's these kinds of conversations that can really start that process. And I was thinking about in the last election in Georgia, there was a special election. And in that special election, Senator Reverend Dr. Uh, Raphael Warnock was elected to the Senate, the first African-American senator sent to the U.S. Senate by the state of Georgia. And in between the regular election and the special election, 20,000 young people had birthdays so that they could register to vote and vote in that special election. And that was part of the game changer because in some of these elections, it's just a couple hundred votes and young people were a big part of that piece of history here in the state of Georgia. Absolutely, and it's it's um, it's what people died for. As I do the civil rights movement and the civil rights history, uh, there's so many people that that gave us the right to vote. Our freedom that we're we're doing today came through the ballot, uh, not through the bullet. Dr. Mandela was president of South Africa, not through the bullet, but through the ballot. So therefore, it's much more powerful elections, and uh, so many people died for us uh, to have a freedom. When you go to a library and wherever you are in the United States. That right to go to the library came from the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Birmingham. Uh, when you go to a, a, um, a service center or a department store, a library, a, a park, all those rights came from people who suffered and died in Birmingham. So therefore, we have a responsibility. What I always ask myself, what am I living for? Am I going to live this world? Am I going to leave this world better than when, I, when, I, uh, when it came into me? And what are my responsibilities? And what am I living for? What, what's life about? Am I here just breathing oxygen in and, and not helping anybody or serving? And so I found out through my, through my struggles and through working for what is right, that when you help other people, <clears throat> you help yourself more than you help, uh, you, you help other people. You're helping yourself. So therefore, always be aware that uh, you want to help somebody. You want to help somebody that's not as, as fortunate as you are. And that's the way, that's what life is about. It's, it's a connection. And Dr. King understood the connection of all of us. And it was just not for black people, it's for all people. Dr. King was a black leader, but he was concerned about all people. It was not uh, just people of a different color. In fact, we were only 12% and Dr. King of 12% of the population. And Dr. King's philosophy mobilized people of goodwill, not just black people, people of goodwill. More, more white people died in Selma Alabama, the right to vote, more white people were killed in Selma than uh, black. So therefore, this is not a black thing. This is a people. And anything you do in your community, make sure it's a people organization, a people thing, and not just signifying a specific on a specific race, because that would be out of character with Dr. King's philosophy if you only did thing uh, for one particular ethnicity or race. That's such an important point and an important conversation, even through the Black Lives Matter movement about how do we be, how do others become allies, active allies to be part of that? We're getting some really good questions in, Charles. Um, Ms. Lewis is asking, she says, I volunteer with a teen program where fighting has become a way of life. How do we change the culture to inspire nonviolence? 
That's an excellent question because <clears throat> when I was raised in coming in St. Louis, it was my way of life. I was I was violent before I was transformed in 1975 by Mrs. King. Mm-hmm. So therefore, I understand violence. I was an angry African American. I was angry because what the United States had done to my father, who was a graduate of Drake University, four-year college, and he could only operate the elevator at Ralston Perino. And so I was angry that why would they violate my father? When I was nine years old, I went to the park in St. Louis to swim, and white people tried to hang me, and, and they took my bicycle, and I run. why would they beat, why would they hate me? So I began to dislike, and I was uh, a way of life. I used to have to fight to school and fight home. So you can change. And uh, what changed me was I began to understand what, what, I, what was I achieving through fighting? And what was I achieve? What could I be getting to achieve through another philosophy? And my Christian values said respect of the body, you know, all the things that, 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 that my Christian values were saying, but I couldn't tie my values in with my behavior. So the King Center and training and listening uh, to Dr. King and, and Mrs. King and all the people who worked with them, they explained to me what nonviolence was because I had a misconception of nonviolence. I thought nonviolence was singing We Shall Overcome and marching and praise the Lord. I didn't want any part of that. So what you do is, my short answer is you have to get into training to see what it is, and then you have to you have to educate a critical mass of people, and those leaders begin to, uh, begin to make it a way of life because we can change society. We've changed schools, communities, and the police department will have all kinds of experience. So it can be changed, but the key thing is to understand what it means and get people to begin to educate and support what you're doing and that way you have a critical mass uh, of people and it becomes a way of life. Right now, uh, you can't do anything to make me hate you. I just refuse to give that energy of hate. Before this, before I met Mrs. King, I was very uh, disliked to people. But right now, I, don't, I can't let you uh, rent space in my mind to make me uh, hate you as a human being. I just refuse to do it. So it's, it's training, working on it, uh, working with yourself at home, working with the people you say you love and also uh, practicing it. So for Ms. Lewis, the first thing would just be for, for the way she interacts to start to emulate nonviolence, but would you recommend that she start talking, like maybe bringing some of the people together within this um, teen program that she's a part of and, and sit down and talk through that a little bit? Yeah, the first thing is you wanna find an issue that you care about. And then you want to find out, and we want to get people to talk about, just ask questions. And then you want to get the training because if Dr. King has six principles and they're on, they're on the website and look at those six principles and see, can your behavior adhere to those six principles? Because everything you do have to adhere to those six principles. So therefore, I, I, I recommend getting an issue. Look around your school, your community, and find something you're concerned about. And then begin to ask questions. Could this be better? Uh, we've had schools where they haven't uh, had fights, you know, in over a year because the whole the whole school was critical mass of people that understood that this is not the way we solve problems. So yes, but first question, the first thing is to get an issue, and then begin to ask questions because questions would bring you a whole lot of suggestions, et cetera, and then get the training from the, the six principles and understand how Dr. King did this because he left a blueprint for us. Dr. King left a blueprint. I love what you're saying about coming together to fight for something, you know, it's like putting that energy towards a positive end. So Jack's a- I'm sorry, Jack's asking a question here for us, Charles, asking, does being nonviolent mean we should not react to violence or is there an appropriate way to engage? Yes, and uh, that's an excellent question too, because I had ten uh, on on the website of the King Center. There are six principles that Dr. King developed after the Montgomery movement, and he said this is the way you change society. And he also this is what you do as a way of life because he was poor from Gandhi, and he wrote these six principles. So therefore, the principles guide your response, and that's what makes it nonviolent. If you don't, it makes the Kenyan nonviolent. If you don't respond, if you don't adhere to the six principles, you're not practicing Dr. King's philosophy. So the first thing is that understand what nonviolence means. It's never spelled with a hyphen. It's, it's one word, nonviolence, and how you can use it with your relationship with your parents in the school or room, with your teachers and the church, and how it becomes a way of life. But you've got to go inside yourself and understand these six principles 
and then use those six principles in all your relationships. And it helps because with my wife, um, I'll be married 60 years, February the 3rd. And without nonviolence, I don't think I would be here, Cheryl, because I had to realize how violent I was to people I said I love. And sometimes you're more violent to the people you say you love and your family, the way you talk, uh, the, the way you respond to your children. So these types of things, this is holistic nonviolence, not just the physical. Maybe could you, happy anniversary. That's my birthday, by the way. So I'm going to be thinking about you on your 60th anniversary. That's so amazing. Um, I was wondering if you could think through like a scenario, talk us through, because I'm just thinking about anytime you're on Instagram or TikTok or whatever. I mean, all around us are, are people, you know, divided and then in each other's face about it and conflict. And, you know, violence is not just physical, it's words, it's, um, it's lots of different things. So it, it, let's say, as Jack was asking us, if someone approaches you violently, either like threatening physical violence or, or with their words, what, how would, how would you respond in that moment? Do you walk away? Do you say something? Uh, no, walking away would not be what Dr. King advocated. Uh, Andrew Young said nonviolence is aggressive, organized, goodwill. You cannot walk away because you didn't do anything. Gandhi and Dr. King advocated you always do something, but it's not physical. So for instance, if somebody is, um, and I've done it in the police department, I've done it when I was uh, in, this, in St. Louis um, with problems and I'm in my home. When somebody comes to you, uh, the key thing is to understand that you have the power in a conflict. That's the key thing. The second thing is you have to ask yourself, what is my goal? What is your goal in this conflict? If your goal is to show people that you're, um, you're better than they are, that you can overcome them, you can uh, talk louder or cuss louder than they can, and you want to put them down, then that's going to be your behavior. So you have to ask yourself, what is my goal? If your goal is to make sure you can lift that person up and not violate them, then your actions become, follows your goal. So therefore, you have to ask yourself, what is my goal in this conflict? And then after you understand your goal, you control the conflict by your questions. In a conflict, you never make statements because statements bounce off the head. Questions are answered, and the quality of the question determines who controls the conflict. If you're in conflict with uh, your siblings or your friend, your best rap, and you just begin to develop some quality questions to ask, uh, why did you cuss me out? What did I do to make you cuss me out? Why don't you like me? Those questions cause you to um, have a response because people respond to questions. They reject statements. Now, the key thing, very shortly, and this, this happens in our training, we teach you how to do this in the King Center, but the key thing is that in a crisis packed situation, you doing something genuine but unusual, you can arrest the conscience of a person. In fact, you can put handcuffs on a person's conscience by you doing something genuine but unusual. It can't be funny. It has to be genuine but unusual. You can arrest the conscience of a person. So your response, and I have several examples in the civil rights, in my, in the rights movement and in my life that you can do that. And you, it's work. Dr. King's philosophy is creative, dynamic. It's not training, you know, like we teach you one, two, three. It's, it's thinking out of the box, getting out of your comfort level. Now, I love that concept. I love to hear one of the examples when you're talking about handcuffing someone by by doing something that's not expected, because if someone's approaching you in violence, they're expecting violence in return. You can um, you can put handcuffs on their conscience because it says I care for you and I love you. I don't like you. I like what you're doing, but I love you and I'm not going to let you violate me. And the, but that's a discipline. And that's the that's. That way you're fulfilling Dr. King's philosophy of the beloved community that said we can lift everybody's potential full to their fullest potential. In a classroom, are we challenging everybody to their fullest potential? You can have a beloved community in the classroom. And so we can we can begin there, we can expand it. But first of all, start with your family. Make sure the way you talk to people that you say you love and your family, the people you go to school with, ride the bus, make sure you're not part of the problem. So it starts with you. And then it expands. But uh, let's just take How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Mm -hmm. If you try to eat an elephant uh, with one, uh, more than one bite, you're choked. So therefore, let's do one step at a time and see how it begins with you. And then you can take it to the world.
you talked about how in the civil rights movement there was so much training and i feel like this is what's happening right now because i'm thinking to myself i want to be ready with some of the questions that you're saying and i know everyone on the call could say that too what are some questions that we would have prepared so that when a moment like that happens we can respond with a question instead of a statement like that's such a key tool you just gave us that can turn a situation so differently like jack was asking like what do you do in those moments and just being ready to know i'm going to have a question instead of responding with a statement is so key and it's why knowing these principles is so important and the king center has a leadership academy that is such an important and unique experience um, it's for anyone ages 13 to 17 who have an interest in nonviolence digital in engineering and entrepreneurship. And I just encourage you all to seek out those resources through the King Center. And there's a lot on the website and you can be part of the Be Love movement. It really starts with each of us. So I just wanted to mention that because I feel like this is just a start of not just a conversation, but some action. So the questions have been great. So I, everyone keep the questions coming because we wanna make sure that you're taking away what you need from this to, to make a real difference in what you're experiencing uh, around you. I mentioned social media, Charles. I think it's no longer is it just person to person interaction where we see different ways that violence is woven into our experiences and our communities. It's happening online so much and that's in everybody's hand at all times. You, you have to really recognize that it's here and it's not going away. So what I say is you put a balance to it. If you're on social media um, 16 hours a day, you sleep eight, uh, that's too much. So what, what you want to do is, is put a balance to it. I asked my, grand, my, uh, my grandsons, I have great grandsons, all boys, one girl. And I asked them, could they um, stay off their phone for uh, a half a day? or one day, not use the phone. They say, yeah, I can. So therefore, we, we've got to look at what what are we letting go into our, letting, what are we admitting into our brains, into our heart, into our soul? And if you're doing that 20, 18 hours a day, sometimes, um, Cheryl, I have to turn the media off, the media, because it's, it's just too overwhelming. It's, it's the violence. We talked about that today, this morning, when you said the violence that, that you just reported this morning. You have to back away from that, and I have to read something insp inspirational. So therefore, I try to I try to keep my spirit strong by reading something, a poem, or singing a song, or just uh, reading a pleasant uh, book to get my mind out of that consumption of violence because it will overwhelm you, mm -hmm. and you'll begin to think so negative that you say, "I can't do this. The world's corrupt," and that's dangerous because. There's more people in the world that want to be the live and let live than there are people doing violence. And a friend of mine told me, he said, Charles, uh, most people in the world are not committing violence. We only see 10, 15% of that. The other 60 or 85% we don't see. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, enjoy your social media, but don't be consumed with it. Put a, put a balance to it so and, and pick up something else and read something inspirational or sing a song or write a poem or, or recite a poem. I have things I recite over five or six times a day just to keep my spirit um, strong. And when you are engaging on social media, think about the same things you're talking about in face-to-face in -face conversations about how do you make that positive? How would you ask a question rather than blurt out a statement? You know, some of those principles in those exchanges too. And we were talking about the importance of having relationships with people with lots of different experiences, different cultures, different ethnicities, different races. Talk about why that's important because that's something every single person on this conversation can really think about trying to do. I was thinking about how Dr. King would have Sunday suppers and he was very intentional about bringing people to a dinner table that looked different ways, that had different life experiences because those conversations could lead to bringing down walls better understanding and then ultimately some solutions but we can have those in our everyday lives whether it's in school or our neighborhoods or wherever we're out and about yeah first of all you're absolutely right and that those principles help you um 
focus yourself because a lot of times when we get out, we get up in life or we get to be adults, we think we um, know it all. We have monopoly on brains and nobody knows anything. Our children don't know anything. And, and um, sometimes it's our, our, our partner. So therefore you have to always check yourself and be able to listen. Uh, there's a difference in, 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 in listening and hearing. Most of the time, conflict causes because we are not listening, we're hearing. Hearing is an automatic function of your ear. Listening takes a conscientious effort on your part. Most conflicts happen with the family and the schools and the church because people are not listening. So therefore, part of our training is to make sure that you are listening to the person that you're talking to. Dr. King, sometimes they, they would think that Dr. King had gone to sleep on the phone because he was listening to all his advisors and they were saying, Dr. King? And so he was taking in all their positions and then he would synthesize what they're saying to say, okay, this is what we do. So therefore I want the people to practice on listening. Now, when you're in a conflict, make sure you're not trying to get your defense mechanism back up because you're not listening. You're trying to see how you're gonna come back on your mother or your siblings or the teacher but just practice listening skills and then make sure you understand what that person is saying. And Dr. King said, if you're mature enough, uh, when you have people, that's why he brought people around him in different uh, st uh, stations in life because there's threads of truth in everybody's position. And Dr. King could take all those threads of truth and say, okay, I'll change my mind. When I was a captain in the police department, I listened to everybody, the patrol officers, my lieutenants, because sometimes they had a better idea and you have to be courageous enough, that's one of the principles, to say, hey, I was wrong and let's do it your way. So therefore, that's why you bring in people because uh, my grandmother and you know, older people said two heads are better than one. And Dr. King practiced that. He had more than two heads when he talked because he wanted to help get the best out of the situation and not just how he thought it should be done. Cameron is uh, agreeing with you saying listening is optimal. And I don't know if anyone else can relate, but I can think of times where I'm talking to someone and I feel myself as they're talking already thinking about the next thing I'm going to say instead of just slowing down, coming down and really listening, it, you know, so that it's more can more can be accomplished. I think it seems like a simple thing, but it's really a deep thing that you're describing. Principles become, they become a part of you. It becomes, it becomes second nature to you. Once you work on it and practice it, Cheryl, you can do this. You can be a, you don't have to have a Dr. King's name. You can do this in, in all your relationships with, when you relate with people, it becomes second nature. Just like it is, the violent has become um, a second nature. We can change it to nonviolence because we can just practice it. And the more you practice it, and don't be afraid to fail because you learn more from your failures than you do your successes. Just don't keep failing. So when you do something wrong, just say, oops, I did that wrong. I won't do it again. So that's a learning experience. So practice it and, and make sure that you begin to look and see what could I have done different. My son always asks when he say uh, when he's in a conflict, he said, Daddy, I always ask myself, what could I have done different? And when you begin to be, become that critical of yourself, you really begin to grow. That's maturity. Mm -hmm. It's like humility is a superpower, you know. Um, Charles, I was thinking about um, something that you said earlier, and 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 it's why your story is so powerful. Because I appreciate you just being so candid with us when you were saying, you know, I was angry. I was part of that culture um, in the police department, and 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 this transformed me because it tells anyone it's it's possible, and no matter what you felt or or, or the circumstances in your life. This these techniques work and and they change your life and that means a lot and I was just thinking about whatever anyone on this call faces on a daily basis to know that the principles that you're sharing even in this time together they they're not easy they work and as we learn them they can be a part of our daily experience absolutely and I always encourage young people that. Um, don't keep looking in the rearview mirror about what you did yesterday and, and how what, what happened yesterday. Look out the front windshield of the car. That's where you're going. So what I'm concerned about is not what you did yesterday, but what are you going to do today and tomorrow? That's the key is that change, change your behavior, change your thinking, uh, help others. And and uh, I call it like a tape recorder. Quit playing that tape recorder about what happened to you and what you didn't get when you were young. You know, that's looking in the rearview mirror. You can be anything you want to be. And in South Africa, I told the young people, 
um, in fact, in India too, that if you have a goal and it doesn't scare you, it's not big enough. If your goal doesn't scare you, it's not big enough. Get a bigger goal. And those people in South Africa and India, their goal was, I want to come to the United States and study. And I said, okay, that's your goal. If it doesn't scare you, it's not big enough. Nobody can stop you from that goal. I never thought, Cheryl, I'd be traveling around the world from St. Louis, 1992. I didn't have a passport, didn't uh, have any idea. Mrs. King took me in as a law enforcement officer. And Mrs. King, normally the people in the civil rights movement, they don't like law enforcement officers because how they misuse the law in the civil rights movement. And I still can't understand how Mrs. King saw something in me and took me in as a law enforcement officer and taught me all of this. Not only changed my life, Cheryl, she probably saved my life. Hmm. Well, I think she knew the power of someone who has the experience on both sides of that equation. I'm so I'm so thankful personally that she made that call because it's just been it's meant a lot to me to learn from you and hear your story over the years. And Jack just joined the chat and said it's so powerful to be able to have the courage to admit when you're wrong because that can be such an opportunity for a learning experience. And I think that's really such a key. And we started this conversation by talking about that all the people here joining us and a lot of the young people really do have the power to change things moving forward. What would you tell them about how they can individually take leadership roles wherever they are, whether it's that's in their classroom or as Ms. Lewis was talking about within, you know, like a, an after school uh, program for, for teenagers. I guess it just takes one leader to start changing things around. We certainly saw that with Dr. King. Yes, and there's so many uh, examples of that where one person just asked a question or saw something that they wanted to improve in their community or saw some, somebody that was hungry or a young lady, I think she's listening now, Dr. Marvin, her daughter went on uh, to, to Birmingham with me and she uh, was excited that uh, she could do something when she saw the young people in Birmingham that took an action with, with uh, Dr. King. And she went back to San Francisco and, and looked at the, the immigrants on the border, the children, and she began to make butterflies. And uh, she organized her school. I think she was about 10, 11 years old. And uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi called her to Washington, D.C. So she's still making butterflies. Just something that are helping people for children on the, on the, the border and, and, and of, uh, of the United States. So you can just look around your community and look at your school dropout. You know people who are going to drop out of school. Uh, the, the, the students know people who are about to fight. <laughs> they They have a... They have a better communication than AT&T, Cheryl. They, they know all this. The police doesn't know. The, the teachers don't know. The principal. So we've got to organize the students so they can make a social responsibility statement in my school, in, in my community. So we can solve this, but we have to do it as a mass, uh, critical mass of people. And that's what nonviolence teaches is mobilizing and organizing under the under the foundation of nonviolence. And so uh, it's it, to me, it's 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 so simple because I've seen it work and I've done it. But we want to share this to make sure that our students that, that are our future. They're 100 percent of our future. And uh, we if we can go to the moon. I just read they put a, some telescope up in the in the universe a million miles away. Sure, I can't even envision a million miles. These young people have all the opportunities in the world. They can the, the whole world is waiting for them and the technology. And so we want to make sure that they're ready to walk in and they, they have a, their, their head and their mind and their morals, the morals that uh, respects people, respect all people. When you were saying, you know, about students, they, they know everything, they are locked in, they're, they're, they know what's happening around them. I just thought about, you know, using Dr. King's principles, like in that moment when you have that information, do we make the choice to help diffuse it or resolve it, or do we light a little fire and and and, and make it make it bigger? And it's decision by decision that can change the entire culture or an experience of a school or a a family or a community. And I'll say one thing that's very helpful. I can't teach. I can't do the workshop here. They got to come to the King Center, but the key in in problems in our community. We want to make sure we don't look for the symptoms because symptoms are, are the consequences of root causes. 
For instance, drugs in the community are a symptom of a much bigger cause. Black on black crime symptoms. So Dr. King and Gandhi, like an onion, they would pull off the hulls of the onion looking for the core. What's driving that behavior? Violence needs a nurturing, at least has, has to have fertile soil to be nurtured. So therefore, when I go in the community, I look at what's nurturing that behavior because acting violent is out of character. Mm. Acting violent is out of character. There has to be something that's nurturing that behavior. So Dr. King and Gandhi look for the cause of the violence. There's an old African uh, proverb to say, if, you, if, you're in a, if you're downstream in a river and you see people that you keep pulling out of the river because they're falling in the river, don't just keep pulling the people out of the river, go upstream and find out why the people are falling in the river. Right. And that's what we want you to do is go in these communities and look at what's driving that behavior. And boy, it'll be very clear to you because people are acting out of character. If you change the conditions, like Dr. King said, if I change the conditions of the United States, I'll change people's behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking at, is looking at changing the, the, the root cause, the conditions, and the conditions of people going to that pipe, that pipeline, a prison pipeline, for, uh, using drugs, dropping out of school, or being pushed out of school, and all the systemic racism. That's, that's, the, that's the nurturing of violence. And we teach our young people, how do you do that in a loving way? We have time for another question. One more question. I love crystals typing in. Yes, I always tell people that you have to address the root. That is that is so true. And it's really slowing down to really see what the root is and then mobilizing to address it. I want to throw it out there. If anyone else has a question, um, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who would say this, but I really could listen to you all day and really appreciate the insight and your experience and your knowledge. And if anyone else has a question, we have time for one more question. And I'd love to get to that. Um, but I, I just, there's so many things that stuck out to me today about having a question instead of a statement to really talk to people about finding a cause to rally towards finding a positive instead of fighting against something, fighting for something, about how nonviolence is something we can practice in relationships with our families, our teachers, our friends, anyone around us what seems small can have such a big impact. And more than anything that everybody on this call can implement everything you're teaching to us in their everyday lives and can make such a big difference in how the decisions are made at the ballot box. And that that's why there's such a fight over voting because that's where the decisions are made that get implemented in these other places in our society. And that's really the key and wouldn't it be great one day if we were talking about voter turnout, not in 40 and 40 or 50 percent being record breaking, but in equal access to the ballot and, and a huge turnout um, for those people who are making the decisions that impact all of us. So any other questions out there that we can address before we say thank you to, Dr. to Charles Alfin Sr.? Um, and anything else, Charles, that you that we haven't talked about? I want to give you the last word. Is there something else that you want to mention before our time is up? Oh, Crystal. Crystal, thank you. Crystal asks, how do you deal with microaggressions when you're trying to build community when they aren't aware, especially? I think that's such a good point. Some people uh, intentionally are giving microaggressions. Some people might have microaggressions they don't even know they're doing. Yeah, but you have to make a definition on what do you consider microaggression? Yeah. Um, being honest and straightforward, is that microaggression? So therefore, I have a definition of what that means and make sure everybody understands your definition. Sometimes you're on AM and they're on FM. So you have to make sure that definition is like racism. People have all different calls for racism. So make sure when you say microaggression, um, it's a definition to it. The other thing is that you want to ask when it happens, you want to make sure that you tell them in a loving way, well, I felt I felt disrespected when you said that, or I felt like uh, you were, um, you know, in my in my space. And uh, don't be afraid to say how I felt. Don't say you were in my face because now you're accusing them. So just take it personal to say in the first person, I felt I felt like you violated me. And then they can discuss why you felt like that. But so therefore, stay in the first person and don't 
point the finger at them as what they're doing because they may think that they're not being microaggression. It, it could be from your experience. So recognize that you bring to the table, your values are based on your experiences that you've experienced, that you've had as a child and coming up in your culture. And everybody's not like you. So uh, when you feel like somebody is in your space, doubt your first impression and get some information about what they're saying and how they said it and where they're coming from, like young people say. And that's 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 one of the first steps in the, in the, in the training is information gathering. So therefore, make sure my, my response is make sure you understand what that means. Or do they do you on the, are you on the same frequency? Sometimes we're on AM and they're on the FM. Get on the same frequency to make sure that word, um, especially now, there's so many different meanings for words, you know, with, our, with so many people in our country. What does that mean and how do you interpret that? Robin just wrote, thanks for sharing. I say the same thing. I'm glad you said that. Um, those conversations are important. And, and personally, I would really want to know if something that I said was offensive or hurtful or um, I needed to do it differently. And in, in those conversations done in the way you're saying can really change so much. So thank you. Thanks for all the questions, everybody. And Charles Alphen Sr., you are incredible. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for sharing your life experience with us and traveling the world to do that. Um, really, it, it's so valuable and it means so much and we can't thank you enough for the time. Thank you and thanks for all the listeners because this is my uh, audience that I respect and honor because they're our future and if we can get them to understand history and understand the mistakes were made, that we can take this world to the what Dr. King called the beloved community where there's there's respect and lift up to people to their highest potential and no violation of people because you don't live in a certain space or you don't speak a certain language. So I am in, I'm excited. I am optimistic because I can see our young people are catching on. And sometimes we take one step backwards, but we take three forwards. So thank you, Cheryl, for your time, what you're doing, and also the King Center. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, thank Dr. Bernice King, who has taken her mother's work Mm -hmm. uh, remember, Dr. King is assassinated, and Mrs. King, architect of the King Center, and now Dr. Bernice King is taking it on to another uh, generation of the technology and the things that her mother was wanting all young people to understand uh, her husband's uh, wish and philosophy. And Dr. Bernice King now is doing that. So we want to say mm -hmm. a shout out to Dr. Bernice King. Yeah, the work, the legacy, can, and the need for the work and the legacy continues. And I uh, want to just mention that for students, applications for the Beloved Community Leadership Academy that we mentioned a little earlier come out next month. So hope this is just the beginning and that you will all want to get involved in, in bigger and, and meaningful ways. Thanks, everybody, for your time. We want to introduce now a continued learning nonviolence video. An honor to be with you all. Hope everyone got something that will really be life changing from our time together. Nonviolence is the answer to the crucial political and moral questions of our time. The need for man to overcome oppression and violence without resorting to violence and oppression. Man must evolve for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. changed the world when he demonstrated what could be achieved through nonviolence. Now you can learn how to live and practice this philosophy yourself through Nonviolence 365 Online, an innovative digital experience developed by the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change. Nonviolence 365 Online features Extensive video interviews with real nonviolence practitioners, including the King Center CEO, Dr. Bernice A. King, King Center certified instructors and trainers, and veterans of the civil rights movement. Explorations of the historic campaigns that helped Dr. King forge his philosophy. Immersive, annotated reading experiences that enhance Dr. King's most influential writings on nonviolence. Custom activities including quizzes and interactive scenarios to help you practice along the way. Real-world exercises to help you start applying nonviolence in your daily life. 
Nonviolence 365 is a love-centered way of thinking, speaking, engaging, and acting that leads to personal, cultural, and societal transformation. It isn't just a concept for philosophers or political leaders. Nonviolence 365 is a powerful, practical approach to dealing with conflict and dismantling injustice. Whether it's in your personal life, in your school or workplace, your local community, or a national movement. Dr. King, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, and many others sought to create the beloved community, a society built on global cooperation and equity. This wasn't a lofty utopian dream. It's a realistic and achievable goal because each and every one of us has the power to make it happen by committing to nonviolence as a way of life. Take the first step today with Nonviolence 365 online. Trust that you had a great time today as I did, and I trust that it was very helpful to you. I'd just like to remind students and teachers, take the pledge. And teachers, please complete the survey. Feedback is very important so we can continue this great work. Thanks again for joining us. And our next event will be February the 27th. But more information will be sent to you um, on this. Thanks again. That ends our program.